Hey, good morning, and welcome to the Euro Patient Podcast. I'm your host, Vic Sinise. Glad to have everybody here. So we're going to go ahead and start our episode. And uh, this week, we've got a great episode for you. We're going to talk about how is a prostate biopsy even done. So we're going to deep take a deep dive into this procedure. Maybe you're scheduled for one. You want to know more about it. So let's start out with what it is. Actually, it's, it's an examination of your prostate tissue that's done in our office. And we take tissue samples from the prostate, which are then examined under a microscope by a doctor called a pathologist who's searching for cancer cells. The uh, was a blood test called the PSA that probably got you here, but it's going to be the uh, results of the biopsy. They're going to kind of answer the yes or no. Was it cancer or not? What everybody wants to know. Now, for this particular study or this particular talk, I'm going to limit it to what's called the truss biopsy or the transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy, where we use an ultrasound machine like you see here in the picture to guide a needle into your prostate gland. There are other methods to do this, but we're not talking about those today. What are the risks? Um, bleeding is always a big risk. We're sticking with the needle, so there is a risk of some bleeding. And there is a risk of infection. We're going through the rectal wall with the needle. So there is a risk of causing an infection. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about how that can be prevented because fortunately, the risk, even though it's there, are pretty low that that would occur. Now, we take our preparation very seriously, and that's how we prevent some of these complications. The big things that we look at ahead of time are blood thinners need to be stopped a bowel prep that we can do and antibiotics that can be given to help prevent infection. So let's talk a little bit about blood thinners. The first thing you need to know is there's a lot of them out there. And this list is by no way comprehensive of all the blood thinners out there. It's kind of the more common ones. And I go with old school um, warfarin, which is a pill called Coumadin sometimes uh, that's been used for a long time. And then there's heparin, which is an injection and Lovenac, which is also an injection. They're both um, shorter acting where Coumadin is longer acting, which means that you have to be off of or stop these things like a Coumadin maybe have to stop up to five to seven days. Now, it's not your job to worry about how how long to stop them. It's your physician that needs to let you know that the uh, Lovenax is one that we use for what's called bridging. So some patients can't get off their blood thinners. What we can do is, um, or your cardiologist may recommend is going on something like Lovenax, which is very short acting, can be stopped right prior to the biopsy. So you don't have to stop blood thinners for a long extended period of time. But these other ones tend to require anywhere from uh, a few days to up to a week. So the new school ones are the ones that we see more often. These may be what you're taking. Um, those are the actual blood thinners, but there's also over-the-counter medicines that we don't always think about. Aspirin, aspirin's a potent blood thinner, even baby aspirin. Although we do, uh, the recommendations say you can do it on a 81 milligram aspirin. When you start getting up to the higher dosages, it can thin your blood significantly enough for bleeding. NSAIDs are things like Motrin and ibuprofen. So again, those things we worry about bleeding. So if you're on those um, again, it's not your responsibility to decide what you should stop. It's your healthcare worker's responsibility. Your responsibility is making sure that you let us know what you're taking, because if we don't know your medications, we may not know what to tell you to stop. So don't worry so much about what they are, but make sure that you let us know all the meds, including over the counter. Uh, bowel prep is a uh, thing that we always uh, advise um, and, our, and it varies from practice to practice as to what kind of bowel prep you may need. For us, we do something called a fleet enema. It's pretty uh, mild uh, type pr uh, product to use. It has a little tube that you put into the rectum and a little squeeze bottle. You just squeeze it. It just kind of rinses out the lower rectum a little bit. Um, it's not like a colonoscopy where we need you clean from stem to stern because we're not going up more than just, uh, you know, kind of about that far, about an inch or two into the rectum. The reason we recommend a bowel prep is not because we can sterilize your bowel with it. It's because we don't want stool sitting right there where we're going to go and put the probe in and the needle in. So that prevents us from having to cancel out some cases by having patients use a bowel prep. Antibiotics are usually administered for this um, as a protection against infection. Don't be surprised if it turns out it's going to be an injection because more and more the resistant organisms, uh, the oral 
antibiotics have a lot of resistance. So we have started to switch over to these things that are either IV or IM injectable type uh, drugs to prevent that. Again, not your responsibility to worry about. Just know that you'll probably be taking an antibiotic. Make sure we know whether you're allergic to uh, drugs like penicillin, et cetera, because it can affect which um, antibiotic that the doctor in your office chooses to have you get. So how is it done? Well, it's done in this uh, lying position, the fetal position. You're laying on your side. Uh, typically, we do it on, on the left side. I think most people do. And it's uh, in that position. And this picture kind of shows a, a nice um, view of what that actually looks like. So if we kind of go here, you can kind of see that the rectal wall and the prostate are really right on top of each other. So this does make for a nice, easy access, just puncturing that very thin wall. I always say, if you, I remember as a kid making sausage, which is the intestine wall. Um, uh, so that casing over a sausage is about the thickness that they're penetrating. So it's really thin. And you just pop that needle through and take our samples using ultrasound guidance. So this is a very precise placing placement of the needle. This is what it looks like with our setup at our office. Anyway, we take six from the right side, six from the left side. So that's these little pads you see are where each sample is put. Um, and they come from different areas of the prostate and they go into a corresponding bottle that's marked exactly where they came from. So we know uh, it helps the pathologist, you know, determine is this throughout the entire prostate or just to one area. So it gives us some good information. Now you can see this first needle here is our local. We give a local block. So that's a, a product called lidocaine, which is a numbing agent. So the first thing after we put the um, probe inside the rectum, we inject it right away to numb it up. And it's really minimal discomfort to give that, maybe a slight burn, um, but it's gonna knock out the pain during the procedure. Now, this other thing below it here is this really neat instrument called a biopsy gun. And it's, it's a spring-loaded needle that fires in and takes the samples. It does it so quickly that it's almost um, helps to make it very painless and gets a very nice sample for us. So you'll hear this clicking sound as, as it's done um, and some vibration you might be able to feel from it going off, but you should not feel pain because of the local anesthetic working. I always like to show patients this before I put it into the sample jar. This is what the samples look like. It's that very skinny string you see here. That's a prostate sample because we're not taking big chunks out of you. It's these are the inside diameter of a needle about one inch in length. And we take 12 of those. How long does it take from start to finish from when that probe first goes into being finished? It's probably five minutes or less. So it's really a relatively fast procedure. And then everybody wants to know, does it hurt? Well, you know, you're going to feel it. The probe going in generally is got some discomfort. I say it's kind of like the finger exam you probably received earlier. So it's the probe is about the same size as a finger. So it's a little uncomfortable going in. Once it's in place, it tends not to be as uh, much discomfort. And then, of course, once the local is given, you should not be feeling pain from the needle going in. It should pretty should do a good job of blocking all that pain. So I put it kind of in the two, three zone. It's uh, it's definitely well tolerable in, in the office area. How long is the recovery? It's relatively quick. I mean, and I, uh, you know, you're going to have some discomfort from having the probe in. Most patients say by the time they get to their car, they kind of forget they even had it done. So it's usually not long term. But if it's lasts longer, Tylenol type discomfort is, you know, reasonable to take something like that. Um, you will have some blood, some bleeding, you know, going through the rectal wall. So you'll probably see some bleeding um, from your, in your stool or when you wipe yourself, that type of thing. It should be small amounts, kind of what we call scant amounts. Also, when you go to the bathroom, you, see, you may see some, you know, redness to your urine. You may even pass a clot or two because, again, it could bleed a little bit and, and see it into the um, urinary stream. That should only last about Two, one to two days. So it's usually pretty quick. Now, blood in the semen is also something that's fairly common. The semen can be red, bloody, or even brown bloody because old blood looks brown. And that can last uh, up to about six weeks or longer. So 
if you see uh, blood in the urine or stool and it's small amounts, and even if it lasts a couple weeks, don't even get nervous about that. But and blood in the semen is probably never something to worry about. It'll clear up. All those things will get better. It's only heavy bleeding that we worry about. So if you're having heavy bleeding or high fever, like 101, 102 fever, you'll know shaking chill like you're coming down with the worst flu ever. Let your doctor know that uh, you're having these problems and your healthcare worker can instruct you on what the best thing to do is. Now, here's kind of an important thing. You know, some people assume if there no news is good news. So your physician's, your surgeon's office should have some kind of protocol in place for how you're going to receive your, your biopsy results. We always schedule an appointment to come back so we know that you're getting them. But maybe it's going to be a phone call or the portal, whatever your doctor's office has, has decided, make sure you get those results. Don't just assume since you didn't hear anything that everything was fine really important that you're told your biopsy results because again this is going to be yes i have cancer no i don't have cancer so make sure you get that result and as always i do have a handout available go to the website at europatient.com and pick up that uh print out that handout this one again is from the suno organization that i've been a part of and it's a really good uh nice simple thing to to look at and uh has a lot of good information. I'm hoping that, that you learned a lot from the uh, from this our discussion. And be sure to tune in next week because next week we're going to start working on some of the information about the prostate. So what is enlarged prostate? What is BPH? And then what are the treatments? We're going to have several weeks devoted to that because there's a lot of treatments out there. But be sure to join us this week to learn a little bit more about the prostate. So we talked about how to biopsy it. Now we're going to talk about the benign diseases that affect it. So 